thank you for joining us today for the launch of the foreclosure and eviction analysis tool in partnership with DataKai. To start us off, I would like you to imagine something. Imagine that it's April, 2020, the COVID pandemic has swept through the country, turned our world upside down. We are hearing that millions of people have lost their jobs, but imagine that our government doesn't actually track employment. And so we have no idea what the unemployment rate is. We don't know who has lost their job, which industries have been the hardest hit, and which states are the most battered. Imagine what would have happened to our national policy response had we not had any of that data. And yet, this is the situation we face when it comes to housing loss. Homes are the most valuable asset for most Americans. In addition to providing shelter and protection and well being, we spend the largest share of our wallet on rent and mortgage. And yet, the federal government and most local governments collect and share no data on evictions or foreclosures. We have no idea how many Americans are losing their homes each year, where geographically housing loss is concentrated, who is losing their homes, and when. I'd like for you to just stop and think about that for a second, just how crazy that is. How can we make good housing policy, good economic and social policy for that matter, without basic data on whether families are able to hold on to their homes. Two years ago, um, New America and DataKind began working on the issue of improving America's eviction and foreclosure data. We began to advocate for developing a national and local eviction and foreclosure data infrastructure. Since then, a set of eviction data recommendations we developed together with Eviction Lab, DataKai, National League of Cities, and many other partners have been taken up by HUD in a report to Congress on the feasibility of establishing a national eviction database. But HUD staff will be the first to tell you that any effort to collect and analyze housing loss data has to start locally. That's because evictions and foreclosures move through our county courts. That's where the data trail begins. And it's our local leaders, city housing department staff, legal aides, county level housing authorities, local journalists, advocates who most need this data and can best use it. And so for the last 10 months, we and our partners at DataKind, along with the National League of Cities and the Stanford Legal Design Lab, have partnered with 14 cities and counties to develop and test FEE, an open source tool that allows local leaders to collect and analyze their own eviction and foreclosure data. We're thrilled to release this tool to the world and hope that you'll use it. I think I neglected to introduce myself at the outset. My name is Yulia Panfil. I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America. I'll now hand things over to my colleague, Sabiha Zainobai, who led the development of FEET to tell you more about how we got here. Then our partners at DataKind, Mallory Schaff and Manu Sharma will demo the tool, including its outputs. And after that, we'll move into a panel discussion featuring leaders from three of our city partners, Hayward, California, Hampton, Virginia, and Tucson, Arizona, as well as the National League of Cities, to discuss how cities are using this tool in real time to improve their understanding of local housing loss. And with that, I'll hand things over to Sabiha. My name is Sabiha Zainalbai, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Future of Land and Housing team at New America. Um, as Yulia mentioned, we wanted to provide a little bit of context for what precipitated the development of the of FEET, the foreclosure and eviction analysis tool in the first place. Um, so eviction and foreclosure is the most common form of displacement in the US. In a typical year, an estimated 5 million Americans through eviction and foreclosure. And that's just what's being documented. Displacement through informal means are not recorded and are thought to far exceed instances of formal housing loss. 
Um, so for this reason, uh, and over the past two years, New America and Datakind have partnered to better understand housing loss across the country. Uh, we first began by collecting as much eviction and foreclosure data as we could from county courts across the US, um, leveraging this data to generate insights about who's being displaced and where. Um, what soon became apparent, however, is that without a coordinated or standardized data collection mechanism of eviction and foreclosure data, um, developing a comprehensive understanding of what is happening is challenging, if not impossible. So in addition to analyzing evictions and foreclosures in select localities where housing loss data is accessible, including seven counties across the Sun Belt, we also um, have been working in partnership with Datakind and a lot of other organizations like um, Eviction Lab and National Low Income Housing Coalition um, to develop a set of recommendations that build out local eviction data infrastructures that can feed into national um, databases. So through this work, we've really learned a lot about um, the housing loss data landscape. Um, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, one of our key ta takeaways from this work is that the ac access to housing loss data is one of the biggest barriers to understanding more about displacement for cities and counties. Next slide, please. Um, so our previous research finds that one third of US counties have no access to eviction data. And that's to say nothing of whether the, the two thirds that do have access to data um, have access to data that is uh, high quality and comprehensive. Um, we know from, from our prior work that cities and counties face um, either incomplete or partial data and data that varies widely in whether it's standardized, digitized, or whether it's publicly available. Um, but still, a majority of counties in the US do have some level of access to eviction and foreclosure data through their county courts. Next slide, please. And we know how crucial having eviction and foreclosure data is in preventing housing loss, especially in ways that are responsive to local demographics and local housing loss. Um, so without this data, we don't, you know, it's difficult to know where housing loss is most acute, who is being evicted or foreclosed upon, whether evictions or foreclosures are rising or falling over time, um, in addition to things like how much back rent is owed. Um, and if during the pandemic, for example, if evictions and foreclosures are continuing despite the moratoriums. Um, and all of these things make it really difficult to know whether, um, it makes it hard to know whether, um, how to target rental assistance and how to conduct outreach for, evic for things like eviction diversion and other upstream pre-filing programs. It also makes it difficult to track and understand how evictions and foreclosures are perpetuating racial inequities and to see whether measures put in place to curb this are actually effective. Um, and ultimately, it just it makes it more challenging um, to just keep people housed. Next slide, please. So the catalyst for developing the data tool was really in response to this pressing data need at the local level, um, in which those on the front lines of tackling these housing crises um, lack not only the data, but often also the capacity, um, including the resources to be able to incorporate into decision-making in, in an ongoing basis, and not only for um, you know, a point in time, one-off analyses. So building off our past work, um, we partner with Datakind and the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab, which is co-facilitated by National League of Cities and the Stanford Legal Design Lab to develop this foreclosure and eviction analysis tool, which um, you'll be hearing a lot more about in just a second, but it, at a high level, it's an open source data tool that allows local leaders to upload their own eviction and foreclosure data and generate a series of analyses that is designed to answer a set of questions. Um, it, and it can analyze up to three types of housing loss, uh, data on evictions, uh, mortgage foreclosure, and tax lien foreclosures. Next slide, please. So a critical component of the tool development were, was our partnerships with 14 cities and counties who are proactively working to improve housing loss data and analysis um, in their home communities. So these cities and counties are all, they all varied um, in their access to data and in their analytic um, activities to date which provided us data kind in New America in developing the tool with a good range of context uh, to understand how the data tool could work for um, and could work for and be generalizable across um, as many jurisdictions across the country as possible. 
Um, so later we'll be hearing, as Yulia mentioned, from three of those cities as part of a panel discussion. Um, but there were many more cities involved in this as well. Um, and you can see on our website, a list of all of those. Um, but before we get to that panel discussion, I will pass it off to my colleague, Mallory, um, to provide an overview of FEAT. Thanks so much, Sabiha, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mallory Sheff, and I'm Datakind's Portfolio Manager. I'm really delighted today to be sharing more information about the FEAT tool. For a little bit of context, Datakind is a global nonprofit organization, and we really harness the power of data science and AI in the service of humanity. We attempt to bridge the gap between technologists and the social sector, and we bring together talented pro bono data science experts with social impact organizations. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll see here that for the creation of the FEAT tool, we actually worked with a small group of incredible, talented pro bono data scientists to really drive this work forward. And thanks to whom this idea became a reality. The toolkit as to be her shared earlier um, can really work with three types of housing loss data, evictions, mortgage foreclosures, and tax lien foreclosures. As you can see here, the functional design really highlights the complexity of the various modules in ingesting, transforming, and then providing key findings on housing loss for these local counties and communities. And feet, I'll walk you through these four primary modules of functionality. The first module is the load module, and this helps accurately ingest the data on evictions and foreclosures that local communities can upload directly into the tool. The module is important. At, it really ensures that the subsequent modules run smoothly and can really generate the impactful analyses and visualizations. The second module is the transform module, and this gives a transformation from the given address data from the evictions or foreclosures and translates this address data into street addresses into, I'm sorry, it translates the streets addresses into the corresponding national census tract ideas, IDs. And this really allows that the unit of analysis for visualizations and outputs to be at the census track level. The third module is our analyze module. And this module aggregates and analyzes the eviction and foreclosure data against a set of 60 American community service survey variables. These ACS variables were chosen from our previous subject matter expertise and collaboration with New America as these variables were most likely to uncover important trends regarding the subpopulations that were most and least vulnerable to housing loss. The output results of this analyze module, which we'll review in the next few slides, and which we'll also present to you directly through the live demonstration, include a time series chart, correlation results, and an output file to facilitate any further analysis that the user would like to do. As our fourth module, and if we could just go to the previous slide, apologies. The fourth module in the functional design of feet is this visualize module. It really produces a package file that can then be imported into an open source GIS software, such as QGIS. And this really provides custom housing loss and demographic maps that at a census track level provide visualizations to the local cities and counties that are using the tool. And so each of these four modules really perform critical steps in the data processing and analysis pipeline. Next slide, please. And so just to share at a high level some examples of the tools output, which are live demonstration will also further illustrate. We use here uh, 2017 data from Hillsborough County in Florida. As we can see here, one of the tools outputs are time series plots. And these really provide information to localities so that they can understand when over the course of a year, evictions and foreclosures are most likely to occur. Next slide, please. 
With this second tool output, which are cor correlation analyses, we're able to provide cities and counties an opportunity to better understand who is most at risk of eviction. As you can see here, we're using these 60 American Community Survey variables to really demonstrate the richness of understanding of risk around eviction and foreclosure. Next slide, please. In this last slide, we can understand at a visual level, the maps at a census tract level around housing loss to really understand where in a city or county evictions or foreclosures are most acute. And so these are just examples of the tool output, but I'm actually now delighted to hand it over to Manu Sharma, who was a team lead for our incredibly talented pro bono data scientists. And he'll walk you through the use of the tool and demonstrate the outputs that are generated from each module. Manu, over to you. All right, thank you, Mallory. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, again, it's an honor and a privilege to be here uh, introducing and demoing this uh, really exciting and uh, we believe really important uh, tool, which uh, again, I, I'm really glad uh, I and the team uh, were part of. Uh, so let me go over to a couple of things here. Uh, so first things first, the best resource to understand what this tool is, what it does, how it works, what do you want to do with it, and how you want to run it, is this very uh, beautiful and very comprehensive and very detailed guide put together by the New America and DataKind team uh, on how to use it, right? Uh, so like more than anything else, I'll be able to show you, like this is your first point of reference uh, on how to use the tool. But the point of doing a live demo here is to is the hope that like just demoing it live makes it a little bit more vivid and meaningful for everyone who's who's on the call. Uh, so I'll go through a demo. But again, I mean, anytime you have uh, questions, you can you can go through this uh, guide. Uh, again, it's really nicely written. Uh, there's four steps. It tells you how to collect data, how to assess the data, format data for the tool, how to run the tool, interpret the outputs, all that, right? So but again, I'll go through them very briefly, but basically, again, all the details that you need are here. You can click into these things and, again, see anything you need. Um, so the first things first, I mean, it's a software tool. So it's built on a set of code. And where do we find the code? Uh, the code is in a GitHub repository. Uh, and if you just I mean, again, the user guide lays it out, it tells you exactly where to go, but in case uh, you want to search from scratch, you go to github.com and you can just put in something like new America housing loss and it'll come right up. Um, so again, just to really quickly repeat this, <laughs> the user guide is awesome. Uh, uh, this is your first point of reference, has a bunch of these sections with all the details. Uh, so go to this first, but I'll, I'll show you how to look at, uh, look at the tool. Uh, so first of all, let me go back to GitHub. GitHub is where the code is stored. I am going to put in a new America housing loss uh, here, and you can search and find this repository, which is new America housing loss public, right? Uh, that's where all the code lives. If uh, many of you are data nerds or code nerds, you can go in there and actually <laughs> look at all the code. It's open source. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of instructions here. Uh, again, all of these are again uh, listed in the user guide. But uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, these are here for a reason. That it's like the way the code works. It's it's pretty important to actually follow these somewhat rigorously so that you can run it correctly and you don't run into unexpected errors. So again, these are the instructions from the tool, how to install it, how to download it, how to format your data, and uh, where to go to, uh, again, uh, download libraries and such, different operating systems, all that. So it has everything here. Um, so next, uh, let me um, show you a quick data set. I mean, just to, again, make it a little bit more meaningful as to what your input data looks like. Uh, so Basically, it's something like this. Uh, this is uh, a set. Of, it's a set of fake data, by the way. So I'm I'm allowed to show you actual addresses, <laughs> uh, real addresses. Normally, that would not be uh, good. But uh, the main point again, this fake data. I can show you uh, the addresses. But basically, the main point is that anything you you input into the tool, the basic criteria are an address and a date. Uh, those are the key things we look for so that we can 
plot the time series, we can geocode data and so on, right? And this is a, again, a set of fake evictions data, um, which uh, basically can just add a row level, each of the evictions in the, in, in the, uh, in a certain, like, you know, geography, it could be a city, county, I mean, whatever is relevant to your use case. Um, and uh, in terms of how it looks in your file structure, typically what we um, recommend is that you have a, uh, a specific directory uh, only for this, right? Uh, it, it, and the structure of the directory, again, is quite important. Uh, you should only have the input data in the directory and, you know, you can have evictions data, mortgage foreclosure data, and tax lien data as, uh, again, Sabiha and Mallory uh, previously mentioned. So these are three types of data you can have. It's okay if you don't have all of them, uh, but you need to have at least one of them for the tool to work. Uh, so that that's uh, that's how it's typically set up. So there's an input data directory. And when you run the tool, all you do is point to this directory as like telling the tool saying, hey, here's where you can find my data. Now run the code and produce my output data, which I'll show you in, in, in a little bit, right? So just a quick uh, now overview of how the tool actually works, how it runs. So this is my screen. At the very top, you'll see uh, a bit of like, you know, again, this, it's a long path, but basically the important part is you do want to be in this CLI directory to run the tool, uh, that's pretty important. Again, the instructions also say this both in the user guide and the GitHub repo, but again, uh, be careful about this. And the command you're gonna follow is gonna be somewhat, um, I'm on a Mac, so I have a slightly different command on Windows. You might have a slightly different command, but again, all this is listed in, in the user guide and the instructions, but basically the command says run this file, which is the main file for to, to enter into the code, load data, um, and, I'm pointing it to the exact path of my data, which is which I just showed you in my uh, sort of explorer window, right? I mean, so it, like it was in this data kind data slash input data. And again, this uh, hyphen, uh, this slash at the end is kind of important. So once you give it the input path, it starts looking into all the directories, recurses through all of the various kinds of data, reads all of them, reads all the files and tells you what it's doing, right? I mean, again, the, there's a lot of output here. Uh, that you're going to see in the screen and that's by design because we want you to know exactly what the tool is doing uh, again it's, it's, first of all it's transparent and secondly uh, it tells you any errors that you have in the data or that you might have encountered in running the tool so that uh, someone can potentially debug it right i mean if if it just fails and fails silently you would never know what what happened right so um Again, that's why by design, we have a lot of output. It tells you, like shows you a sample record. Uh, it shows you if there's duplicate data in your records. Uh, it tells you if there's if certain uh, columns are missing. I mean, they can potentially be, and it'll try to find some alternatives. But again, it's recommended that you do follow the guide uh, somewhat rigorously so that uh, you have the best chance of running it successfully, right? Um, filters out like uh, values that are too old, goes through again, the inventory evictions directory, goes through foreclosure, same thing. Again, however much data you have, it'll go through all of it and just run through it. So it does some data validation for this. all of that stuff up here is all about data validation. Once the data validation is done, uh, now the point is if you have addresses, right, uh, you do want to geocode the addresses so that you can convert an address to the census tract level. And that's the sort of unit of analysis for for all of the data, uh, right? That's the aggregation analysis unit. Uh, so as it says, I mean, just again, it standardized the addresses so that you have the best chance of hitting the census geocoder and getting some results back because again, addresses that are malformatted sometimes fail out. Uh, so it does some address formatting. And if, if you have a bunch of strange addresses that the uh, standardization part of the code can't look at, it'll just tell you that these are the addresses that are not, like, you know, standardizable, please look at them, correct them if you want and rerun it, right? So again, this, this data set I used to run this tool has had a bunch of these strange ones, but you know, so it, it told you exactly what it is. Again, a lot of output, but by design. Um, then it finally geocodes them. And geocoding is a relatively time-consuming process depending on how many records you have. So there's a nice progress bar here uh, to tell you how much time is left and how much time is elapsed. So as you can see for the data set I ran, it, ran in 32 minutes, right? So it had quite a few records. So it, it, and it told you how many records it actually geocoded. Uh, and then the same thing when it had eviction and foreclosure to look at. So it did both of them in series. Uh, 
I did some, did the same thing there. And then there's a bunch of different methods to try to geocode data. Uh, that, that's all, again, module one in some sense, right? That is all the module one part that Mallory showed you, right? Now the thing is, okay, well, and, and then module two is the geocoding part. So the module one is validation of the data, standardization, geocoding, and then getting some of the ACS data to append to it is the second module, right? That's a transform module. Uh, so ACS data, again, that's another uh, census API that it hits to, uh, to get it. It like, you know, if, if, it, uh, if there's an error, it'll fail out here, sometimes with geocoders down, et cetera. But again, it gets all the data and, and it, uh, it creates this housing loss summary by appending all of these 60 variables plus all the all the other geocoded data into a single data set that you can then look at and kind of customize the calculations. Um, and then finally, uh, module three analysis, right? I mean, it, it shows you all the analysis results, uh, saves all that, all the plots uh, to a, the output data directory. I'll show that to you in a second. And then finally, module four for visualization, it uh, it gets this geo package file, which is this GIS data import uh, dot gpkg, which is basically the file you can import into ArcGIS, into QGIS, into like any sort of mapping tool, and like uh, visualize like how your uh, housing loss looks, right? So that's basically uh, a, an overview of like the run output from the tool from beginning to end. Uh, again, very copious outputs by design. Hopefully they're helpful in just letting you know that it all worked correctly, right? And if you get to this geo package point, yes, congratulations, it did work. And then finally, just to show the outputs uh, real quick. So once you have the input data directory, I mean, again, typically, uh, this output data directory is created after the whole tool has run and done everything it needed to. So we'll quickly uh, click into this directory and uh, show you everything. So basically it produces a few things. It's full data sets is just a bunch of, uh, again, it's all your uh, data basically geocoded. Like, so essentially all your geocoded data, the, the raw data is gonna be here. So if you want to do something custom with that data, which the tool does not do, like that's like your geocoded data right there, right? Uh, data summary, same thing. Uh, so you have an ACS data dictionary. The ACS variables are a little inscrutable by name. Uh, so uh, we have a data dictionary that we output. And then the housing loss summary, which has all the all your geocoded data at the census tract level joined with the ACS data, like all the ACS variables. So again, any custom analysis you want to do, that's the file you want to do it on. Uh, then it has the plots, which is what Mallory showed. So the time series plot. Uh, is again, this is what it is. Uh, and this actually is real data, by the way. Uh, uh, I can't tell you who it's from, but it is it is real data. Uh, uh, and as you can see, it's, it's very useful. And if you can imagine, right, this is 2020, March uh, and April, like, you know, there's the, this sharp drop off in eviction, for example, is gonna be at least partly driven by the CDC evictions moratorium, right? So you can see some of these trends, they are gonna be quite uh, useful to see. I mean, same thing on foreclosure, see a bit of a dip here. Uh, so again, that's, that's basically the intent of this time series plot. Then you have these, some of these correlations that uh, Mallory showed you. There's, there's a lot of stuff here, but I'll show you a couple of important things. So again, Mallory showed this to you, which is, uh, uh, your foreclosures uh, or, or your housing loss correlated with all these ACS types of variables. We've given them uh, descriptive names because the ACS names are less than descriptive, <laughs> let's say. Uh, so you'll again see for your uh, geography, what are the biggest correlations, positive or negative? The negative ones here, positive ones here. And the second part of that is to say, okay, it's not just the correlations that matter, like it's also the context of the right so what this does is this contextualized correlations tells you uh the, the, i mean you you were shown some previous work that data, data kind had and uh, new america had done together on other uh, other geographies and what this does is puts your results against like benchmarks them against like what we've seen from previous data so again there's nothing wrong if your red dot which is your data is like outside of these like box and whisker plots uh, that's totally fine. I mean, that is your data. It is. It is your. It's unique to your geography. That. Uh, but the point of this is that potentially it gives you uh, something to look at and say, oh, is do I potentially have a data issue, or is this something very unique to my geography that might uh, uh, 
be different than what other people are seeing, right? And then that's that's valuable information as well, right? So that's that's why we produce this contextualized correlation plot. Um, and then finally, um, these detailed results, like this is like, I'm not gonna go into that, but this is like literally the plot of all correlations, so all, variab all ACS variables against your data. Again, which ones are positively negatively correlated. So again, every single data point that you had in your data is basically gonna be in one of these plots, right? So again, I'm not gonna go into that, but that's basically how your outputs are gonna look like. Uh, so that's, I think uh, that's uh, from, all from me uh, in a sense. So I'll, I'll stop here, hand it back over to, uh, to Sabiha and, uh, uh, yeah. uh, and hopefully that was useful. Yeah, thank you so much Manu um, for that comprehensive overview. Um, so just really quickly before we head back to, uh, or head over to the panel discussion, I wanted to share how you can locate um, some of the resources, the tool itself, and then some of the resources that um, Manu shared. Um, next slide, Angela. Thank you. So um, we will share this PowerPoint um, on our on our webpage along with a live recording. And so these are all links here, but um, there's a publicly available GitHub link where the tool is actually stored and um, where the tool can actually be downloaded that Manu shared. Um, of course, there's the comprehensive step-by-step -step user guide. Um, I will just reiterate that um, as I'm not, I don't have any Python background or coding knowledge. And so that user guide that we created is really intended to um, not only provide documentation for the tool, but also um, for anyone who might find Python or uh, using a tool like this intimidating. Um, it, it's complete with screenshots for every single step. and. Really, um, when it comes down to it, after um, after downloading, formatting, and storing the data according to the guide the guidelines in the tool, there's really only three steps that need to be done in Python, which are mostly just navigating to where the tool is stored on your computer, navigating to to that input eviction and or foreclosure data on your computer, and then running the tool against the data. So there's really um, all of the code and output that Manu was sharing on his screen is all generated by the tool um, itself. And it's really meant, designed to sort of easily automate um, those functions to create these outputs. Um, we also have a FAQ page, which is at a high level, sort of just answering questions, you know, what is the tool? Who is it intended for? What kind of data do you need? Um, sort of as a resource to be able to share with uh, you know, local partners um, who might be interested in a tool like this. And then lastly, um, through partnering with partner sites, um, we've also developed a blog series called Data to Drive Housing Loss Decision Making, which is available on our website where we sort of document insights from both the partner sites, but also just our other work in this area. Um, and you can find things like a brief, we wrote a brief on uh, techniques to measure informal evictions, for example, um, and we hope to really continue to build out that blog series to share insights on creating this local data infrastructure. Um, so before moving on to the, the panel discussion and passing it over to Yulia, um, I just wanted to reiterate that one thing that Manu mentioned that's important is that uh, part of the reason to create an open source tool like this is so that data can remain confidential, both eviction foreclosure data as he shared, the tool can be downloaded on your, on your computer um, and your local data can be uploaded into that tool. So all, ensuring that all local data is remaining confidential. Um, and with that said, you, know, the, you saw the outputs that uh, Manu and Mallory both shared. And the hope here is that we can build upon this tool to um, conduct additional analyses too that we know um, is at the forefront of uh, cities and counties um, needs and questions as they attempt to prevent evictions and foreclosures. So um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Yulia for our panel discussion. I am so pleased to welcome our panelists. Um, Lauren Lowry, who is the Director for Housing and Community Development at the National League of Cities and uh, the a lead on the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab. Uh, Christina Morales, who is the Housing Division Manager for the City of Hayward in California. Sarah Lanius, 
who is the Community Safety, Health, and Wellness Program Director for the City of Tucson, Arizona, and Lauren White, the Chief Neighborhood Development Specialist for the City of Hampton, Virginia. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, please feel free to turn your videos on. Um, so we will have a um, about uh, 35 to 40 minutes of discussion followed by audience Q&A. Uh, so please, uh, you know, for the audience, do feel free to submit uh, your questions using the Slido function on your interface, and uh, we'll be posing those questions to the panelists uh, at the end of the discussion. So uh, I will start with Christina, Sarah, and Lauren White. Um, it would be great if you could just briefly introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little bit about your motivation for engaging in the National League of Cities and Stanford Legal Design Labs eviction prevention learning lab, and then also the development of the fee tool. Uh, and we can go in that order, Christina, Sarah, and then Lauren White. Thank, thank you, Yulene. I'm Christina Morales, Housing Division Manager with the, the City of Hayward, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I was motivated to participate in the Eviction Project Prevention Learning Lab because we have a recently adopted rent stabilization ordinance and trying to help community members understand their rights under the ordinance we found challenging and the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab would use that, um, could provide us the support we need to better help us understand how to reach out to those individuals. Um, specifically for the housing loss data tool, when we had updated our, we recently updated our ordinance, there was a constant conversation about needing more data from our council members, from the community, from people who wanted housing policy changes to groups that didn't want it to change. And there was just a, a complete lack of data. Um, and what we were hearing from the community was a plea for help that the housing prices were too high, they were facing eviction. Um, and what we're hearing from the landlord groups is that they needed to be able to support the properties, have sufficient revenue to cover their costs, and had a right to a fair return. Um, and what was happening is the conversation was turning to one where it was a, um, a conversation about having isolated tenant incidents, incidents from the landlord groups and losing that plea for help. Um, so we really needed data that would demonstrate that there was a pervasive problem that needed um, a legislative response to help with. Um, so I'll, I'll go next. And again, my name is Sarah Lanius. Happy to be with you all this morning. So, um, you know, for the city of Tucson and our partner Pima County, um, participation in the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab made a lot of sense for us because we had been observing extraordinarily high eviction rates long before COVID. And it was kind of a, um, a, a challenge that community members were facing, but there was no um, really strong coordinated um, effort around that. So through the Learning Lab and then through the partnership with Data Kind in New America, um, we were able to really think through how can we better utilize um, court data um, and make it more accessible. And so just to kind of share, it's not as though there weren't already folks in our community, um, specifically partners at Pima County, that were looking at that court data, right, and looking at it spatially to understand where evictions were happening. But because, and if for those of you who are tuning in, if you didn't catch it, one of the things that the tool does is it makes it much, much more e efficient to geocode that data. So where we were previously having um, staff members at the county spending an extraordinarily long period of time kind of trying to figure out addresses as they were put into court records, right? <laughs> Getting those fine tuned so that it could be geocoded and then could be looked at on a map so that we could understand where evictions were happening. It was a really intensive um, process. And so that created some barriers, quite frankly, to being able to really look at the data spatially and to do some of the additional, additional analyses that were needed. Um, and so, you know, partnering with uh, Data Kind of New America on this tool was very, very helpful for us in terms of identifying an additional, um, uh, an additional resource 
to actually make that much more achievable, right? And to open up those pathways for our partners working on eviction prevention. So thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Lauren White and I am the Chief Neighborhood Development Specialist for the city of Hampton, Virginia. We are a coastal city in Virginia of about 135 people. We're right on the Chesapeake Bay. And we were motivated to participate in the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab and the partnership with DataKind because in 2016, Eviction Lab released a report and Hampton, Virginia, along with several other Virginia cities were in the top 10 list of highest evictions across the whole United States. So that sparked a conversation both at the state level and the local level across Virginia about what we could do to reduce our eviction rates in Virginia. And so this partnership with DataKind has been very helpful for us to get a handle on the, first of all, the data that's out there and how we can utilize this data to lower the eviction rate. Fantastic, thank you so much. And uh, now Lauren Lowry, I will turn it over to you. Um, and perhaps we should have actually started uh, with you to introduce the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab, uh, what it is, and then learn, looking across the EPLL cohort, what have you seen as city's most immediate needs when it comes to eviction prevention? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lauren Lowry, the Director of Housing and Community Development at National League of Cities. Uh, the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab um, is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network where we're constantly looking at best practices and policies as it relates to eviction prevention. Uh, we dive into things from eviction data to eviction diversion to uh, landlord and uh, landlord and tenant education to communication and outreach to court support, where we're kind of looking at evictions comprehensively. And um, looking across the 30 cities, uh, as it relates to the most immediate needs, uh, as it relates to eviction, uh, that cities are grappling with on a daily basis. I, I think one is continuing awareness and education um, how to really target outreach to both renters and landlords, and what does that mean using traditional uh, means or non-traditional. Um, also, how to target rental assistance to ensure equitable distribution and um, building and sustaining a uh, eviction uh, data infrastructure. I would also say funding because the main question is after all these emergency rental assistance programs are gone, how can we continue to funding the infrastructure that has been built during the COVID-19 pandemic? Thanks, Lauren. And uh, turning it back to the cities, Christina, Sarah, Lauren White, um, what uh, are yours to the extent that you uh, didn't touch on this in your introduction? Um, what are your city's most immediate needs um, related to eviction, uh, but also foreclosure prevention to the extent that you're working on um, foreclosure issues? So I think our most immediate need is, as Lauren mentioned, is that as the rental assistance subsides, we have to figure out um, ways to support community members. Become, it's becoming more clear that people are being evicted because they don't have enough income to support their rent payments. Rents in Hayward, California have been skyrocketing and it's housing has become unaffordable to the community. In terms of foreclosure, we are also, we have implemented another program that's going to provide um, loss mitigation counseling to homeowners so that they can avoid foreclosure. We're anticipating that while in California, there is a program available from the state that will provide financial assistance, um, not everybody will qualify for that if their servicer is not participating in it. Um, so we're concerned that many low-income homeowners may lose their, their housing, and with rental prices being as high as they are, it's hard for them to recover and, and stay community members in Hayward. Um, I'll, I'll jump in here and uh, echo 
exactly what Christina shared. And then also um, just share that, you know, as part of our participation in, in um, working with the tool, um, we were able to draw upon our eviction data fairly easily. And so we ran the tool using our eviction data. We still have yet to do that with the foreclosure data. So that is definitely um, a, a need um, for us to really kind of get a handle um, on how, it, how foreclosures are um, shifting at this time. Um, the other piece I think that we have been um, trying to make sure that we're getting a better handle on is pulling in data from um, where households that have received assistance through ERAP and then also, um, you know, while we were working with the tool, we were also launching um, a, an emergency eviction uh, legal services program really through our partners at Pima County. Um, and so wanting to understand kind of the geographic impact of both of those programs vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, trends around eviction um, over the last six months and then moving forward. Our most immediate need has been um, using the data to target people who are experiencing eviction, but doing intervention before it reaches the court system. So we have really honed in on the part of the tool set that identifies um, potential actors or identifiers that can be used to help target our resources and outreach to help people before their evictions reach that court system. Thanks. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll move back to the uh, city uh, panelists in a second uh, to talk a little bit more about the actual process of getting the data that you needed uh, in order to use the FEAT tool and some of the outputs that you were able to generate. Um, but before uh, turning to you, I wanted to turn back to Lauren Lowry and ask a more general question. Looking across the cities in the EPLL cohort, uh, you know, eviction data is uh, kind of a subset of the issues that the cohort is working on. Um, but from what you've seen, what are the most needed types of eviction data that would be the most useful for the cities in your cohort in order to make data-driven decisions around eviction prevention? Yeah, um, the types of data I would suggest would be historical. I think collecting historical data allows cities to establish a baseline of what eviction filings are given in a week, a month, and a year typically. I also think about geographic data um, to display the addresses where each eviction is occurring, to, to identify hotspots, and to be more strategic in deploying resources. I would also say demographic data is important. That way programs can be designed equitably and we can really begin to think about uh, how renters as well as landlords are assessing the funds and programs available. And I think also what is important is program metrics, right? We have eviction filings um, that have been filed and that have judgments, but it would be really great to tie in uh, program metrics from mediation programs, housing navigation programs, right to counsel, and emergency rental assistance programs to have a more comprehensive uh, view or outlook as to how evictions is impacting, impacting local communities. Thanks, Lauren, uh, for going through some of those, um, uh, so some of those points. Um, so uh, I want to turn to the city is uh, to uh, talk through the actual use of the tool. And as, uh, as we found in our own work, uh, you know, before developing this tool, we tried to source eviction and foreclosure data ourselves. And it was such a nightmare. Um, like it was just, you know, we, we tried to source it from, you know, maybe a dozen different county courts and it ranged from being, uh, you know, relatively easy in a few cases where that infrastructure existed to being just incredibly time consuming and challenging, just figuring out how to get our hands on data that was purportedly being generated, but wasn't being aggregated into a database, wasn't being shared, you know, just dozens of phone calls, 
I remember people physically walking down to courthouses with checks in hand in the middle of COVID. I could go on and on, but instead of me going on, um, I'd like to turn it over to um, Lauren White and also Christina. You uh, both, uh, you know, both the city of Hampton and the city of Hayward um, didn't have uh, eviction data on the ready. You needed to go through the process of obtaining this data from the county court or somewhere else in order to uh, test the feed tool. So can you share a little bit more about that process? Um, what barriers did you face and how were you able to overcome them? And what lessons are you able to share uh, for other cities who might be grappling with these same challenges? So in Hampton, we receive our eviction data from the local sheriff's department. And the reason we decided to use that as a source is because that represents the actual evictions, you know, who have been served that writ of eviction and are in that two week period of moving out. So we use data from our sheriff's department to measure our eviction rate. Um, prior to this process, uh, our community development department and our sheriff's department were not interchanging that data. It was just sitting on a computer in the sheriff's department. Um, they weren't measuring anything. They were just getting their orders from the court and then going and serving them. So part of using this tool was coming up with a process to share that data between the city and the sheriff's department so we could effectively use this tool um, and really set up a process for you know, sharing the data. And now as a result of this process, we actually share the data quarterly. So I get a report from the sheriff's department and I sometimes have to manually go in and make sure things aren't duplicated. So there's still part of the process that we can improve upon. Um, and then I share that with our IT department and they are responsible for mapping and you know, putting together reports. And so that has been one of the great outputs of this process is that we do have a, a process now for sharing and um, analyzing our eviction data. Yeah, so uh, for the city of Hayward, I mean, in California, California law um, limits what is what kind of information about evictions is publicly available. So most of the county courts don't have any data available um, initial requests for information from the city were, you know, turned away. You have to know the parties of the eviction in order to be able to request the information. So it seemed like an impossible task to be able to get the information. But being part of this process and knowing the opportunity we had, um, we started the process knowing we had some records based on notices of terminations that were being filed. Um, but we decided to make one last attempt to see if we could get better data. And so we reached out to our Board of Super Supervisors office um, that represents Hayward and asked them if they had any connections in the county court's office. Um, and they connected us with the executive officer who then explained the administrative process for requesting public records through the courts and what the limitations were and what specific data we could ask for um, and who the proper contacts were. So we were able by you know, going above our above to our county um, board of supervisors, we were able to leverage the right contact to be able to access some while still limited access information that is definitely showing us kind of the volume and magnitude of, of evictions in Hayward. And as Lauren kind of pointed out, looking at that historical data, knowing where it was in 2019, we can see that it's it's dropped in during our moratoria and then trying to make sure that it doesn't go up back up to those high levels once the, the eviction moratoria have ended. Thanks so much, Christina and Lauren. Um, uh, and Sarah, uh, Tucson already had, as you mentioned, an existing pretty clear pipeline for accessing eviction and foreclosure data. So in the case of Tucson, um, what were some of the barriers that you faced in analyzing this data and incorporating it into decision making and how were you able to overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you know, one of the biggest barriers for us, and I feel uh, mildly silly saying this, but I think there's a lot of people tuning in who can relate to this, which is that 
Um, we had a, an all hands on deck situation throughout um, city of Tucson and Pima County for folks who were really focused on eviction. They were on the front lines providing eviction prevention services. And so being able to really truly just take the time collectively to review the data, to ask additional research questions so that we could go back and do further analyses and then critically to be able to implement, right? To act on those findings was slowed down a bit. Um, I think for good reason, right? Because we were able to actually um, provide emergency rental assistance and, and uh, provide uh, emergency legal services to really change the experiences that folks were having um, in, in uh, eviction court proceedings. Um, but so we are still in the process of really going back and doing more of a deep dive there and um, uh, you know, bringing the collective brain power together to really make sure that um, we, we aren't having any additional blind spots, right? That we're, that we're really able to get the most um, learning out of that data and then to think strategically about how to act moving forward so that it's an ongoing process for sure. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. And, you know, as you can see from Sarah, Lauren, and Christina's um, responses, and this is sort of what we found when we were pulling together the uh, cohort, um, cities kind of lie along an eviction and foreclosure data continuum from some cities who have no access to any data to other cities and counties who have uh, quite sophisticated access and analytic capabilities beyond what FEET is able to offer. And uh, you know the, what the FEET tool tries to do is uh, to wherever you are or situated on that continuum to provide you some tools to analyze the data that you do have and help you obtain uh, maybe the next level down of granularity of that data. Uh, so, so turning back to uh, the city panelists, uh, one kind of last question in the weeds before we uh, zoom out. Uh, all of you were able to run the FEAT tool on your eviction or foreclosure data. And I'm curious, um, what types of insights were you able to gain about your city's evictions and foreclosures with the help of FEAT? And uh, I know it's still early days, uh, we just released a tool, but how are you planning to leverage those insights uh, in mitigating evictions and foreclosures? In Hampton, we were able to use the tool to identify areas in our cities with the highest eviction rates. And that has been really helpful, again, in targeting outreach and services to make sure that they reach the people who need them the most. Um, it's also been helpful to identify landlords who may be in need of assistance and may need help navigating the court system and doing additional outreach to landlords because sometimes they don't know or understand all of the programs that are out there that can help them before they file this eviction. So it's just really been helpful in um, identifying the areas and then opening the lines of communication with both the landlords and the tenants who need that information. Thanks, I, I would piggyback on that. And, um, you know, one of the things that we were able to do by, you know, looking at a broader um, swath of, of um, data, right? So part of what the tool allowed us to do was to go back further. And so we had some baseline to compare to. And so, you know, to echo what Lauren was, sh was sharing, it allowed us to be able to do some very strategic, actually like apartment complex based resource fairs, um, geographic focused resource fairs around eviction prevention and a host of other kind of related services. Um, and so being able to look at that before and after, I think also helped us to fine tune what some of the unique needs might be and to, um, uh, and to make sure that we were making those available. So that was, uh, I think, very, very helpful for us. Um, the other thing that I think it has helped us um, with a bit is just to get a sense of where there's some additional data sets that we could pull in for even greater learning. So again, where are we seeing high rates of eviction, but we're not seeing 
um, uh, upticks of emergency rental assistance, right? You know, is that because there's a landlord that's not accepting the assistance or, you know, what is that? So it's, so I think as we're able to pull in some additional data sets, there will be even further learning there. And so going through this process has really helped us to identify what some of those additional data points are. Thanks. And I think, you know, for Hayward, very similar to the other responses, but I think the importance of correlating the eviction data with the demographic data really paints a picture of what the risk factors are for people to be subject to eviction or foreclosure. So helping us to understand what those risk factors are helps um, help staff to develop policies for councils or board of supervisors considerations that would address the specific needs of the community members who are at risk versus trying to do a blanket policy that may or may not help them. Um, so it really helps us identify this is the population that is at risk and these are the strategies to help them. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, I'll start with Lauren Lowry, uh, maybe speaking uh, generally across what you've seen from the cohort and then uh, turn it over to uh, the um, representatives from the cities uh, for this next question. Uh, what else do you wish that fate could tell you that it doesn't currently? Um, you know, so what are the either uh, types of data that um, you know, you'd be able to collect or uh, you know, uh, kind of um, linking with other data sets? I know several of you uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, what other functionalities we're hoping to uh, keep building and developing this tool, what other functionalities would you like to see? I think um, the integration of program metrics would be really great to really see who is accepting them and who is not. And I really liked how Sarah pointed out, um, uh, maybe they don't know that the program exists, right? And so again, emphasizing that outreach and awareness, but also informal evictions um, would be really great too, because what we don't know, we can't address, right? So those are some of the um, things I would like to see in the tool. I would have liked to see other housing or affordable housing metrics that, um, you know, could help us to understand our eviction problem or even drive our eviction problem. We all know how the housing market is right now. Um, so having other metrics that touch on our, ho our housing market, I think would be very helpful. I love that you said that, Lauren. Sorry, you know, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right, that, it, that would be very, very helpful to look at. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that um, myself and, and the team that I was working with that we kept wondering about was kind of how does Tucson stack up with other, you know, other cities, you know, nationwide. So wanting to just be able to have in the tool some kind of baseline data, you know, based on other geographies so that we kind of know, I mean, I hate to say it, but so we know kind of how we're ranking there um, because that can be really helpful in terms of motivating, <laughs> um, you know, local leaders, right, to act. Um, so, you know, that, that would be very helpful. Um, you know, one of the, one of the interests that we also had was to be able to look at the eviction rate through the tool while accounting for um, housing uh, tenure type, right? So accounting for the percentage of households that are renters um, to really get a little bit more of, a, of a, a fine tuned understanding of what that rate of eviction really is, right? Based on a census tract. Um, and then, you know, another kind of wish was, you know, could we get some additional data at the block level? Um, to, to work with. Um, so yeah, those are a few things. This is a tough question as there's so much data and I th don't think we've gone through it all, but what comes to mind in addition to what um, I think my other colleagues here on the call had said is that looking at kind of the 
the foreclosure or the sorry the eviction process that probably pertains to the for, for, foreclosure process as well you know it seems like it based on data it's a point in time kind of event but it is a process that drags out over time and there's various benchmarks um, and all of that the impact it has on individuals and, and their mental health starts with the termination of tenancy the stress and anxiety that goes with it then to the filing of the unlawful detainer and of course this will be different across states um, and then these different points in the process that people have to be able to understand and navigate and don't necessarily have the kind of legal support they need to defend themselves so seeing it where those kind of pinch points are in the in the process where community members kind of give up um, so that we can see it, you know they're just releasing their rights because they they don't know what to do Thanks. Um, so I'll just ask um, uh, one more question of the panelists, and then um, we'll move into a Q and A. Uh, so for members of the audience, uh, if you haven't dropped a question in uh, yet, please uh, go ahead and do so. So the question is this: um, We know that there is some uh, discussion uh, at the federal level of creating a national eviction database and capacitating cities and counties to collect uh, and analyze their own eviction data um, in order to you know, both have uh, locally available uh, data, but also to feed into a national database. Um, in an ideal world, kind of you know, looking at your experience with um, uh, both EPLL and the FEET tool, um, what types of resources uh, would you need to have um, you know, at the city level in order to allow you to uh, do this type of work kind of in a sustained fashion? And Lauren Lowry, I'm sure that you could answer, uh, looking across the board of city is what you're seeing as the biggest need. Yeah, just kicking it off. I, I can't emphasize funding, right? Funding for staff, uh, funding for capacity building and training, uh, also incentivizing local collection and standards. I think that's important. Uh, creating eviction data standards, as well as providing technical assistance to local jurisdictions. But very much, I would like to underline funding. I'll just say yes, yes, yes. Everything that Lauren said. And, you know, and I think that it's really helpful. It, it, yes, we need a streamlined um, process nationwide, but there also needs to be some ability to um, tweak to local needs, right, and allow for some additional um, innovation. So, you know, striking that balance, I think, is going to be really important. Just again, echoing Lauren and Sarah, funding with an underline and an exclamation point and an all bold and italicized everything you can do in Word. Um, but I think it would also be helpful to have um, that technical assistance, but specifically around um, how to talk to other funders and other partner agencies and our local elected officials and our state elected officials, um, because we really need to have these conversations and get buy-in at that level. Um, so I think that would be an amazing resource. Yes, 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 and yes. Um, and I think I was going to say something similar to Lauren is that we really need to use this data to leverage policies that are at the state level that constrain the local level from providing the kind of resources that we need. The whole concept of evictions as a means to resolve disputes um, is not effective. It has it makes people lose housing and it it it. Um, impedes their ability to find new safe and habitable housing. Um, so looking at you know, eviction data and what it's cost and what it's cost to community members, and then looking at is there a way that we can do this dispute resolution process better, um, intervene earlier and address some of the problems so that it is not, a, people are not losing their housing over minor infractions over their lease agreement or because they've gotten such a large rent increase, they can no longer afford to pay rent. So I'm hearing funding. 
um, common theme. Uh, and I know I said that I would turn it over to the Q&A, but uh, I actually have just one last question that was on my list and I would really love all of you to answer just very quickly. Um, you know, we've had um, a lot of interest from other, uh, not just cities and counties, but other partners, uh, research universities, uh, advocates, uh, you know, who are interested in picking up and using the FEET tool. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, if you had any advice to somebody who is interested in uh, using this tool, uh, what would it be? I think I would say this is a journey, right? Uh, a journey that, as you said, um, a number of cities as well as states, we're on a continuum, right? And so there may be points and times where you have to take back and assess where you're currently at, but that does not mean that the, the journey stops there. It just means that you have to build relationships and partnerships and you have to begin strategically game planning what needs to happen to go forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, that I think the tool really allows an opportunity to bring partners together for a conversation about what, what data do we have and where are the blind spots um, and to really start thinking about what the needs are. And so, you know, I would recommend to anyone who is interested in this, start that process because even if you wind up not utilizing the tool, there is benefit in just being able to have that check-in and kind of know what what is known and and where are the, where are the major blind spots and where there where is there opportunity for more informed um, decision making and you know um, action planning um, and I think that is why wildly beneficial um, above and beyond the the output that the tool provides. My advice to um, any other localities who would use the tool um, is to put together a great team to help you through this journey. Um, we had a team made up of, you know, I'm in the community development department. We had our IT department. We had our city managers department, social services. We had several nonprofits, our local legal aid, and they've just all come together around this eviction issue and the data putting together this data. And it's just been very helpful to have this group of people at the table who can, again, sustain this process after you know the tool is done, so. And I guess my only advice um, would be, I, I agree with all of um, the other comments, but we also have looking, you look at data and it seems so far removed sometimes from the people. And so just making sure that as you, when you're trying to humanize the data in a way and how it impacts your community and who it impacts, it is a great way to tell a story and to show what's going on in the community. Um, so having that data is so important. And while it may be challenges and you may have obstacles and you may have to really struggle to find the right door to get the data, um, it is worth it in order to be able to tell the story and to identify what the community needs are. Fantastic. Well, thank you uh, to our uh, fantastic panelists. Uh, we'll just have about 15 minutes for Q&A and uh, Manu, uh, Mallory, and Sabiha, if you'd like to uh, come back on camera, that would be fantastic uh, because several of these questions are to you uh, as well. Um, so I'll start, uh, Sabiha, with a question to you about how the partner sites were selected. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And um, so the partner sites were selected in large part um, through our uh, informal partnership with um, National League of Cities and Stanford Legal Design Lab, who are co-facilitating the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab. So I think um, a majority of those 14 partner sites are also part, and the three cities represented here today are all part of the Eviction Prevention Learning Lab. Um, so given this, uh, you know, the, the sort of the timing of these projects aligns such that um, Eviction Prevention Learning Lab 
um, was gathering 30 cities from across the country who were um, you know, invested in using uh, data and other sort of resources to really stave off evictions um, at the local level. And so um, that's, I would say, the main mechanism for how the partner sites were selected. And it really was not necessarily a competitive process or anything. It was really having conversations with cities um, who were interested in helping us test this tool and just ensuring that there was alignment um, as it related to data access, data you know, technical capacity, and just capacity in general to uh, work with us. And then um, similarly, for the cities that are not part of EPLL, uh, most of them are cities that we've partnered with or counties that we've partnered with in the past through our prior Data Kind and New America's prior um, work on eviction foreclosure analysis. Um, and I think someone also asked who all who are all the partner cities, and um, we actually have a link on our website. Um, so some of those web some of those uh, links to the tool will take you to our broader eviction and foreclosure data work, and there's. Um, there's more information, even a map that shows our partner sites, uh, not just as part of this, the development of feet, but even beyond that. So um, you can check them all out there. Thanks, Sabiha. Um, next question is to Manu. And uh, the question is around uh, geocoding. Um, so, uh, you know, what is the uh, geocoder um, that was used as part of the tool? Um, if you want to say anything more about kind of the ge geocoding capabilities and how you would use the outputs of the tool to produce maps. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's, I mean, the bulk of the geocoding work uh, here in the tool is done by the census uh, batch geocoder API, which basically means that you can feed in a batch of addresses, uh, street level addresses into that uh, API. Uh, call and then get back all the results on you know what the census uh, track ID for that address is. Um, again, that's a public resource, I and mean, then so you can essentially you know, go to the census uh, website. I mean, they also have a kind of interactive version of that uh, geocoder that you can use if you want one-off addresses, and like we just want to do it one at a time. You can also throw in files into that, like if you really want to do it manually and uh, not use the tool, you can actually throw in files up to I think thousand or ten thousand records and it'll get get you back a file uh, that is geocoded uh, so it's against a public resource you can go to that uh, and uh, we can do it the other part of the geocoding here is uh, a hard resource a housing urban development resource which is uh, a zip to census tract uh, mapping um, so sometimes like you know the, the census geocoder is not like 100 percent accurate uh, in the sense that it doesn't always come back with a, uh, an answer for you uh, in terms of a geocoding. Typically, your accuracy is about 90%. Uh, so 10% of the addresses are just not going to get geocoded no matter what you do. Even if you clean them very well, you're just going to get about 90%. Um, and so the the other uh, HUD one, it's there's no exact mapping. It's just a probabilistic mapping. It tells you, okay, like this is a zip code. A zip code has a lot of different census tracts, right? So the way the tool works is it says, okay, well, there's maybe five census tracts uh, in the zip code. Uh, I'll just take the one which contains the, uh, I'll just like randomly take one in like proportional probability to how much of the addresses it contains, right? So if one of the census tracts is half the, um, half of the addresses in that uh, zip code, it'll take like half the chance that you'll get that census tract and half the chance to get something else, right? So that's basically how the second part of it works. And the way we do it is like, I mean, we know it's not 100% accurate, but it's still better to at least geocode something rather than throw out data, right? And so that's, that was the approach we took. Thanks so much, Manu. So this question, um, I'm maybe going to start with Mallory, uh, but I'd like to actually uh, throw it out to our panelists as well. and. Um, the question is from a county where eviction data is not digitized and it's not accessible unless scanned. Um, and the question is, you know, how can uh, places like this county use the tool, um, if at all? And sort of the second part of the question um, that I think it would be really helpful for um, 
our panelists uh, to chime in on if you have any experience is, you know, how do you move from a place of not digitized eviction records uh, towards digitization? Thanks so much, Yulia. Uh, this is a question that we actually encountered uh, multiple times in our earlier partnerships with you when we were trying to access eviction and foreclosure data from cities and counties to work on our Displaced in America and Displaced in the Sunbelt report. Uh, we recognize that this is a challenge that many cities and counties across the United States face. Um, right now, in using the FEET tool, we do request you know, the data to be digitized such that it can be then formatted into the data format that is required for the FEET tool. However, this FEET tool is really just version one of the tool. And from the conversations today and the questions that the audience members have been asking, we're really starting to think about new ways in which we can enhance or add new modules to the tool. So there will be the potential for us to explore something like optical character recognition, which is, allows us to really lift from these non-digitized pieces of paper the information that is required to then format the data and it put into the tool. Um, so I think this is definitely something that we're learning, a challenge that we're looking to see whether data science can really help unblock um, so that we can really enhance and increase the users of the FEET tool across the country. Um, but I'd also be, you know, really interested in, in hearing from cities and counties perspective as well um, around the steps that they could take to um, to also overcome this. And uh, to add, uh, it may be good to look at the city of Boston because they ran into this problem and they, they took a uh, um, time to actually get their uh, data up to a standard. And you can find that at the cityofboston.gov where they talked about the process that they went to to really digitize their eviction data. Yeah, I, I'll just, um, uh, I can also just jump in and say, you know, I think there's two sort of parts to that question. Um, one is sort of everything that everyone talked about in their answers to that last question on the panel discussion, which it, you know, investing in creating a um, digitized version of this data is very time consuming, but also worthwhile if that is the only way forward. Um, and as Mallory mentioned, you know, hopefully there will be tools available to, to make that easier. Um, and then the other thing I would mention is I'm not, I'm not aware of the specifics around this um, county or city. Um, but, you know, even if that is the case, the, the data is likely digitized somewhere. And so oftentimes, even if that's what's being shared publicly, um, there might still be avenues to, um, you know, as Christina mentioned, figure out who is the person who has access to that digitized data, whether that's the court system or a PIO, a public information officer or someone else, it's worthwhile doing that investigation to figure out whether you can kind of go up the chain uh, or around um, what's publicly available to. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, we have time for, uh, I think, just one more question. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, I think that I'll throw this out to um, anyone on the panel uh, or uh, any one of the participants who's interested in answering. Um, both uh, Lauren Lowry and Lauren Wright talked about how um, to catch evictions early. Uh, so kind of catch people who are at risk of eviction potentially uh, before evictions are filed in court, right? Because once you have an eviction on your record, even if that eviction is ultimately dismissed, it's still on your record. Um, so uh, any thoughts that the panelists may have on how the tool specifically or just eviction data generally can be used to sort of get ahead, get upstream, of evictions um, and uh, you know, as an early intervention tool for uh, people who may be vulnerable to being evicted. Uh, 
I think I would say that the attaching the demographic information to the eviction re record show us information about the income of individuals, um, it, who's below the poverty level, that specific data that really kind of stresses, is this an economic issue, something where community members just don't have the capacity to pay their rent? Um, there's a lot of, when we talk about evictions and we are looking at the narrative from both sides of it, landlord and tenant, there's a lot of narrative about, you know, bad tenants get evicted and the reality is when we look at the demographics there, a lot of times it's hard working people struggling to make their rent. Um, and so when we know that it's an economic issue and they need financial support, then we have to look at programs that would help either one, um, provide that financial assistance or support the tenant with mediation to be able to talk to their, their landlord about the issues. Um, and I think in a lot of uh, complaints that we hear from both tenants and landlords, there is a disconnect between the two parties and having somebody to be able to mediate conversations um, so that they don't escalate, so that they're able to address the problems instead of taking it personal. Um, so figuring out who is being affected and most impacted by evictions then helps us to frame the solutions. Anna yeah, would just I add, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lauren. Okay, Anna would just add the historical time frame to, to see layered on top of the demographic uh, data to really give you an idea of where and when it's happening and how prevalent is happening in a particular location as well. Yeah, I completely agree and was just going to add that the question sort of um, it sort of gets at that the data that is being ingested most likely into the tool is formal eviction data. And so anything that exists outside of the formal court process, um, exactly what Christina and Lauren said, it's really identifying areas historically where those eviction rates and foreclosure rates have been high and then targeting those um, as a proxy really. Fantastic. Well, with that, uh, we are at the end of our uh, time. I would like to thank all of our panelists and participants for uh, taking the time to share your experiences with us. Uh, I'd also like to end uh, by um, saying that we are uh, actively uh, continuing to develop this tool, looking through new functionalities and also uh, sharing it with new uh, audiences. Uh, you know, uh, we're actively doing demos and run-throughs for uh, a lot of different organizations who are interested in using the tool for a variety of different use cases. And that includes not just uh, city and county leaders, but also uh, journalists, researchers, advocates. So um, if this does seem like a tool that would be useful in your work, um, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us. We would love to uh, share it with you and walk you through how to use it. Um, and with that, I will uh, thank everyone once again uh, and wish everyone a lovely afternoon.